I bet you're wondering what I'm doing. What's this in my hand? Come closer. A little closer. It's called reading. And this, well, this is a book. When was the last time you read a book? And I don't mean for school. I'm talking about for the sheer pleasure of being whisked away into another world. Formed by the imagination. Or are you like so many others, sleeping in this faceless land of Nod, where all you see is the tops of people's heads? All these heads bowed in the worship of this. Or this. Look at all these sleepwalkers. In this land of Nod, no one eats. Food is only for the gigabyte to consume. Feeding Facebook and followers. In this voiceless land, fingers do the talking. Wait, I think I see a face. No. It's just another one of those glowing mannequin heads waiting to be captured. You're the only real face I've seen in a while. What happened? Did you just nod off to one of those factory sounds from your device? I need you to put that asleep and for you to wake up, even if it's only for the duration of the show. That's better. You see, I want to take you on a short journey to another land, land the nod, from whence these stories in this book, Mubasa's dreams were spawned. In this land of wonder, the imagination wanders to places like the People's Republic of Harlemia, the Ruby City, oh, and the Pirate City. The mind's eye will gaze at mountains of love and reasons, take a stroll through the forest of feelings, or on the beach of forgetfulness. Stay awake, because in this dream, you will feel as though you have stepped into Noah's Ark, as the tales told are filled with birds like the ruby-throated hummingbird, or the sleepless old owl, frogs, bears, elephants, donkeys, oxen, raccoon, seagulls, ravens. In this majestic land where the legends are made, you will be in the presence of knights, queens, and kings. In fact, one king who called himself Lufin the Magnificent, but the people called Lufman the Midget, was sold two donkeys by a farmer named Atrocious Pump whose hair was two feet high. Well, it turns out that our current president is a descendant of this farmer. So who is the teller of such tales? Well, I think it's best he tells. Dr. John Mannon, welcome. Thank you so much for giving us this treasure of your imagination. Your book, Mubasa's Dream and the 18 Legends from the Land of Nod, was definitely a resuscitation of my imagination. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on your show. It's a great honor and privilege to be here and to be invited. It's great to have you here. Um, I think I've always been a philosopher, a person who asks questions about the reality of things and how they got to be that way. And um, my entire life I've followed different visions of, of reality and try to make one vision or try to make sense of the world that we live in. So this book is a, an exploration of and of my life and an extension of my, my way of, of living. So I'm a philosopher. I'm a college professor by day with a background in law and a jazz musician at night. And um, I try to unite these things into one, uh, one, one reality, one, life, one lifetime, uh, realizing there's so many different facets of us. And uh, our society tends to bifurcate and compartmentalize knowledge instead of trying to make the connections between, say, science and music, um, art and politics. So that's the way I have uh, looked at things, and I'm still the way I was when I was 12 in that respect. Uh, a person of also imagination, which I find is a w one of the greatest tools of human problem solving. When you can imagine the solution you can find the science to fulfill your imagination. And by step by step, we're able to make progress and make a better world for, uh, for humanity. 
This book came out of uh, bedtime stories that I told my two daughters and my son, Rehan, when they were coming up, and other stories, uh, parables that I gave students along the way. And I put it into one collection, and uh, I call it the um, Legends from the Land of Nod. Mubasa's Dream is the main story. And the Land of Nod is a nod to the human imagination and the five senses. The five senses have, have been captured in our world, uh, our intellectual uh, and um, technical revolution. Uh, it's been, a, it's been a, assaulted. We've had three revolutions in human history. We've had the agricultural revolution, which gave civilizations like Egypt and Mesopotamia. We had the industrial revolution, where machines re replaced muscles. Now we have the technological re revolution, where the five senses uh, are being captivated by devices. Xboxes and phones, and um, we have lost our ability to some extent to use these five, five female senses uh, to evolve into their higher sense, higher senses. Uh, seeing becoming insight, hearing becoming understanding, taste becoming discrimination and judgment, um, feeling becoming s sensitivity, compassion, and love, and smell becoming. Uh, uh, <coughs> intuition. Um, so these are things we, need, as human beings, we need to keep in touch with. So these stories are an attempt, also, to fight against artificial, artificial imagination, artificial thinking, artificial intelligence. Yes, our technological world has great advances, and makes it makes life a lot easier. But then it turns it tends to degrade the connection we have with each other. And we become married to our devices instead of our children, our, our siblings, our wives even. Uh, and we become separated in our own homes because of devices. And we have to have a balance. And human life is about balance. If the brain is the husband, the wife is the heart. They have to work together. And th in this society, often the husband, the brain, and the wife are divorced from each other. So this book has a lot of things it's trying to address. But at the end of the day, it's a children's stories, a collection of children's stories, parables for children and for the adults who read them. Mm. So. What you're trying to say is that maybe, in some way, technology is trying to is separating us. But in some cases, I believe that, and I don't want to say what you're saying is wrong, but technology has done some incredible things. Like, we can't necessarily put a man on the Mars yet, but we can put multiple rovers to inspect the environment. What do you think about aspects such as that? I think you're correct. But look at fire. Fire was one of the first, first quote-unquote inventions. Fire is a terrible master, but a good servant. The fire kept in its place can cook and warm us, but out of its place, it consumes us and the, the environment in which we live. So the same thing with new technologies. They can serve us and make things easy for us. I used to spend 10 hours in a library researching something when I was a college student, and I could do it in five minutes with the internet. But that's good, that's the fire in this place. But if the fire consumes me, then I get hit by a car watching the fire, then the balance is lost. So our, our technology be, must be our servants and not our masters. And oft times it has become our master. So we have to fight for imagination. We have to fight for our humanity. We have to fight to touch things, to touch our reading, and to see our readings and to hear our, what we read in all aspects. So, you know, that's, I don't think you're wrong. I just think we're talking about balance. And a society th that's balanced uh, tends to grow. And when it becomes imbalanced, what happens? Civilization, it falls. We talk about the fall of civilizations when they became extreme in one aspect of human, or one dimension of human life. That was beautifully worded, and I agree with you completely. All right, you call this a growing up book. What exactly do you mean by that? Uh, it's multidimensional. If you read it when you're seven years old, you'll get one meaning out of it. If you read it when you're 14, you get a, a, a different level of the same meaning. If you read it when you're 40, 
you'll, ha you'll see a whole dimension of meaning. And you read it when you're 70, then you're looking back at a road that you traveled, and now the trip has a new meaning because you cover the whole, you cover the whole dimensions of the story. So, um, for example, I have a story called The Great Meeting of the Mind. I talk about the, the human mind having a meeting called by the will, the, the reasons, the emotions, the drives. And they're trying to, to elect someone to, to be the president of human society. So that story on its face is a meeting of the mind. But who, who did they select to be the president? Who are the candidates? So you see the, the competing interests of society, you see somebody representing belief, somebody representing the military, somebody representing economics. Now that's on the surface. But really it's about what's competing in our own hearts and minds. Is it our economic interests? Is it our interest in pursuing knowledge? Is it our interest in um, being compassionate, intelligent, and sharing human beings? So you read it at different ages, you get different meanings from it because you have lived. And that's why um, I think uh, multidimensional writing, you use symbols, and when you use the symbols, the symbols are like a seed, so that they become more meaningful as you live life. So a grandfather reading the ruby and the pearl uh, is, hearing the same, is hearing the same story that he's reading, but his grandchild, who's seven or eight, is hearing the story on a different, in a different dimension, on the level that he's on. So that's why I say it's growing up. As you read it, you read it again, you say, oh, I didn't see that. Even the names, every name in the book has a meaning or a combination of names. But it's not readily apparent the first time you read it why the person's called a certain name. Beautiful. Speaking of beauty, Sonia Sanchez, who is one of the greatest poets, activists, and scholars of her time, wrote the introduction of this book. It was so beautifully written, I have to read a piece of it. She writes, Dr. John Mannon, as author of a treasure chest of tales, legends, and riddles, has mastered the ancient art of writing the instructive parable. His are delicious parables wrapped in the stuff of legends, hidden in, in the turquoise of exquisite allegory, which capture mind, heart, and soul. How did she come to write this introduction for you? Well, I asked her to, um, and I know her for a long time, and she's familiar with my writing. In fact, in 1970, I was in her writer's workshop at County Cullen Library, and uh, I, I met her two sons who were twins. Um, they were twins, and uh, they were about five or six years old. I think some, one of the, some of the first stories I told was to them. <laughs> and then later on, when I got married and I had my own children, I had more stories to tell. Uh, so, but uh, she um, has followed my writing and um, Spoken to, I mean, she's been a guest lecturer at my classes at the College of New Rochelle and other, other schools. And uh, I sent her a copy of the book and said, what do you think? Show it to your two sons who are now 40 something years old. And uh, they all liked it. And she said, I, I would like to write an introduction to this book. So I, I was honored that she did something like that. Sonia also writes, spun for the silkworm of his imagination, the tales in this book were spirited out of this father's mystical journeys to the land of Nod. What or where is the land of Nod? The land of, uh, of Nod is the subconscious, the land of the subconscious, the human imagination, the seat of the human imagination. Um, I was fascinated by the term Nod. I got it out of the Bible originally. Um, Adam had two, two sons, Cain and Abel. And when you go to Genesis, Cain kills Abel, then he goes to the land of Nod and takes a wife. And so I said, well, there's only two of them. Who was the, where did the wife come from? Mm -hmm. And uh, I understood at some point, as I grew up, that the Bible was dealing with symbolism. Uh, and it was talking about materialism killing the spirit of the philosopher in a society. Materialism sort of kills the spirit of the poet. And what, what, what what the, what the materialist needs is a society that, uh, s to support his materialism. So it's talking about capitalism in the sense that you go to the land and you find a wife. A wife represents a society, a community. So they say in the Bible, Babylon is a harlot. They're calling a civilization a, a woman. So they're using symbolic language. So I took, I, I took it from there to mean that there is a place um, where one can go out of the normal, uh, three-dimensional reality and go behind the reality to the idea 
a place of ideas that was behind the reality that we see, that we that we exist in. So the so it's the it's the mental universe. The land of lot is the mental universe, and per, the universe is mental, and that er, that everything that we see there's an idea behind it. So I'm going from our world into the world of ideas to examine where our world came from and how our world operates, and by taking the um, reader on a journey, I have him looking in outer space into the world that he came from and coming back to it, his world with a different view of reality. And that's one of the purposes of choosing a fictional pla place that has its own environment, its own decorations, so that uh, the reader would be in a situation where he could see the world where he came from and his position in it much better. Mm. And so this land of not is kind of like the interconnectedness of all minds, like a mental yes, state? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so it's also the land of dreams. Mm. Uh, how and when did you come up with these stories? Well, I came up with them over a period of many years. I mean, it's the, co the collection of stories. I started from 1971, uh, and I published the first one in 1979, which was The Ruby and the Pearl. And uh, the Great Meeting of the Mind I wrote for my students at, at um, the College of New Rochelle for them to read to their kids. And, uh, uh, but it also was a political history lesson. So that was the first one, of my, one of my experiments in multidimensionalism. I had a story that could be read by kids and that could um, be studied as a political commentary about our reality, much on the same line as Plato's Cave which is a story you can read as a kid, but you wouldn't understand what Plato's Cave meant until you got to a higher level of, of learning. So, um, so my daughters, uh, Yasmin and Ziamata, read stories to them. I had a habit where they made, every other night they had to make up a story and tell me a story to, from their imagination. So they were trained in, in storytellers. My son, Ray Han, I read him stories. And in fact, every story in this book, um, Ray Han has read and giving me critical feedback on it. I've changed some stories as a result of what Rehan has said. And uh, so, um, it's always an inter it was interactive work with, with the kids I was talking to and my own pen. Mm. So you said you were telling these stories to your children. What effect do you think that had on them? I think it made them help to make them creative thinkers or keep them, their kids are born to be creative. And and imaginative. So it helped them keep some of that because we don't want to lose that. We won't, we won't be able to imagine our way out of some of our, of our problems, imagine solutions. You know, much in the same way that a man who sees a dragonfly or a hummingbird hovering over flowers said, what if we could fly and stay in the same place at the same time? Then voila, you have a helicopter. It's patterned after the hummingbird. It stays in the same place, you know. And many of our inventions come from our, our imagining things from human in realities and the natural environment. So I hope to keep that going. And I think fairy tales and folk tales are an important part of, of, of culture, and we need to keep producing them. Uncle Raymond's tales, when I was coming up, were very valuable to me. Brother Rabbit, Brother Fox. Uh, the African American fairy tales, but they were political fairy tales. You, you didn't realize them when you were a kid. You read Tar Baby; that was a political fairy tale. So, we need to keep that going. That's an important part of our culture, uh, especially as Afri African people. Mm. We should keep the creative mind going no matter yeah. what. Mm -hmm. You said uh, you wrote in your foreword that sometimes you would have your children make up stories. Do you remember any of those stories? Yeah. Uh, we we were we wrote something together called the adventures of fat head small head and square head, so you know uh, we just said uh, that once upon a time there was a there was a kid who had a square head a square head and one that had a fat round head and one that had you know a different type of head. So tell me about the kid with the fat head. What does what does he do? What does he like to do? And then one of the kids would say he does this. And how about the kid with the square head? And then I would fill in you know and then we had, after a while you have a story. It's almost like stone soup if you know the story of stone soup. The guy is hungry. He doesn't have any money, but he has a stone. He, he, uh, he borrows a pot, put water in the pot with the stone, and he asks the neighbor, he said, look, I need, I'm making soup. You get some carrots. Another neighbor got celery. 
everybody contributes to this soup. And um, voila, all of a sudden you have stone soup. So, you know, being, like, being act interactive with my kids, um, I was able to write better stories. And then using my knowledge of history, philosophy, et cetera, I was able to give it different dimensions. Uh, your children are all grown ups now, so do you still have the make up stories for them, or do you still make up stories yourself? I still make up stories. Yeah, I'm writing, I'm writing a sequel to this. Um, mm. I, um, I wrote a story, and I'm almost finished, it's called A Penny from Heaven. And it was inspired when I went to the bank and I cashed a check, but the person before me left a penny in the cup. Then I looked down, I saw pennies on the floor of the bank. I said, No one wants to pick up a penny. How's the penny feel about it? <laughs> <laughs> pennies are disrespected. But all, all pennies want to do is be like every other currency. They want to change the world. And they want to make change. So you can't, you can't make change if you're on the floor. You have to be in someone's hand and be in, inter interactive with people. And that penny can travel around the world. So I want to tell you the story. But you know, now, now, now I'm telling, I want to tell people in my story how the penny came from heaven. And, and a critical penny that's found in the right time can be worth a thousand dollars. That's true. Oh. Mm. Just to toot my own horn, I always pick up pennies, and okay. I have a nice bag of pennies just in case I ever. Great. I'm a little low on cash. You you should be in the land of nod with us. <laughs> I might move there. All right. Uh, do you think you can make a story up right now for us? A little quick, little thing. What do you want me to make it once? What do you want to make it about the, the studio or something? Um. Maybe about how you feel is going on with maybe another planet. Maybe how do you think the people on Pluto right now are doing? They felt very disrespected because they, had been, they, they were once recognized as being a mysterious planet that was part of the human science of astronomy and, f and philosophy. And Pluto was always the planet that took the longest time to go around the sun. But it was praised for its fortitude and be able to do that. But when the scientists did not recognize them anymore and, they, and, and, and said they wanted a planet, Pluto wanted to show that it was a planet like everyone else and was part of the universal family. So what did Pluto decide to do? It decided to put on a show in its orbit around the sun so it could be seen by the Hubble telescope and reclassified again as a planet. So when Pluto decided to do this, it decided to do this on a night when when it was most visible in the sky through the telescope. And they put on a show a flash of, of, of heating up internally using its inner key, the ice, ice particles that on, its, on its polar cap. And that caused it an explosion on the ice caps and was seen by the telescope. And they said, wait a minute. Its orbit is elliptical like the rest of the planets. So therefore, it's not an asteroid. We're going to reclassify it as a planet. So when they got reclassified by NASA, there was a rejoice on Pluto. They were now rec recognized as an equal citizen in the celestial universe. And all was good in Pluto. <laughs> all was good in Pluto. Let's talk about some of the tales in this book, since there were so many to choose from. I had to limit myself to three. The first one being the third tale told from the idiot, Lufman the Magnificent, and the war against music. Before we talk about this story, you have six stories told from the idiot. Why, Why did you title it like this? Oh, tales told by the idiot. I was incorporating Shakespeare. Uh, and uh, Shakespeare talks about, uh, in Macbeth, he says, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day. To the last syllable recorded time, out, out, brief count, life is but a walking shadow. A small player who frets upon the stage and then is heard, is heard no more. It is, a, it is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. So this tale told by an idiot um, was to get the attention of people to the real critical subject matter that I was talking about, that, that it, was, it was an idiot's tale, but idiots often have something very profound to say. When you go to Barnes & Noble, you'll see chemistry for idiots. You'll see f physics for idiots. So there's a, there's, a, there's a genre out there about idiots saying something important. So I picked up on Shakespeare, and I picked up on the genre about idiots saying something important to say something important. So that's why I chose that, that uh, medium. So I created an idiot in the stories, and I called him Shake Sabir, <laughs> which was a play on Shakespeare, uh, and which was also a play on 
sheikh in Arabic, meaning old man or wise man, and Sabir meaning somebody who's very smart. So instead of saying Sheikh Sabir, Shakespeare, I should Sheikh Sabir, who was part of my adventures in telling these tales of idiots. Mm. All right. So in one of the stories, you have Luthman the Magnificent, who felt really good about himself. Why was his name Luthman? Does it have any meaning? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Luthman is fool man spelled backwards. Uh. Okay, but more importantly, there is a, there's an ancient man named Lukman. And Lukman was the name of Aesop, who was a very wise man. So Lukman, also in the Quran, is a, is a very wise man. He talks to his son, he gives his son knowledge about how to live his life. So I'm playing on Lukman, and I took, I, f I took man and put it on the end of fool and came up with Lufman by spelling fool backwards. So I figured somebody would figure it out by spelling the, I do this often, in this, I spell things backwards, I invert things to hide the real meaning, but also to keep the story going along. And people, I wanted people to ask that question, why was his name Lufman? So I planted that seed. So the, the reader would have to figure out why he was called it. Okay. First, tell us a little about the story of Lufman the Magnificent. But don't give away too much because I want the viewers to read the story. Well, you know, um, I'd asked my students one time, is it possible to kill music? Is it possible to kill music if you could break all the flutes? And some people said yes, some people said no. And um, Lufman was a midget because he was a fool. And uh, his, his, his smallness had to do with his mentality. He, he was, wanted to become king, and he wanted to um, be the rightful heir. And using his evil mother, who was a sorceress, he gained the kingship. But he hated music his entire life. So he decided when he became king, he was going to kill music. And the best way he could think of doing was to break all the flutes. And when he heard that people could sing, he gave an order saying that you, no more singing in my kingdom. And once birds could sing, he knew birds could sing, and there was a very important nightingale, which was the palace nightingale. He had all the birds, their throats slit, but the nightingale escaped. The nightingale escaped into the forest. So he had a, a, a hunt to go find this nightingale, which was the only bird that could sing that was left. Now, I won't give you the end of the story, but um, uh, it was discovered that the song of a person who was still alive in the kingdom could turn apples into gold. So now he became very conflicted because he didn't want to have music, but he wanted to have that song that could turn apples into gold. And there's a conflict that, that, that emerges in Lufman because of his greed and because of his hatred of music. So one of the questions is, can we kill ideas by killing people, by bombing them? by trying to annihilate them, saying we're fighting a war against these ideas by actually killing people. If you can't kill music by breaking flutes, how can you destroy ideas? Or, sh or how can you confront ideas by killing people? It seems I ideas can only be, the bad ideas can only be defeated by better ideas or good ideas. In your bio, I read that you're a jazz musician, vocalist, and lyricist. What do you think of today's music? Uh, today's music is an expression of generational frustrations with the challenges that young people face. And every generation has created a music which speaks to its reality and perceptions of how the world is and how the world should be. Sometimes music is a form of protest. Now, I, I, don't, I'm a, I don't have a personal like or dislike for today's music. I, I've come from a more lyrical and romantic generation. However, I think a shortcoming is that it is short on melodic uh, storytelling. It is heavy on rhythm. And it's um, often accompanied by a visual film. Well, I think it's important for the ear to tell the mind to imagine a visual rather than a visual being provided for the music. So when I listen to music and I don't see a visual, I have my own visual. And every person has its own vision of the, what they're hearing. So um, I think it's part of a, s a symptom of artificial intelligence, artificial imagination being foisted upon new minds. 
and it's a scheme to control our imagination and a scheme to control our creativity. Because other than the beats, uh, there's not much there except degradation of women and family and loyalty and elevation of murder and gangsterism. And it didn't start out that way. It was a political protest music. It didn't start out being a degradation of women and brotherhood and human life. Mm. I'm talking about rap music in particular. Oh, uh, yeah. At the end of a story you write, visiting the Ruby City recently, I saw three statues in the Grand Museum of History. A golden one of Lufman, frozen in time and frozen in gold. Lufman massacred so many people, and you know the controversy regarding this removal of statues of controversial figures in history. So as a historian, what is your stance on this? Statues should be preserved in order to preserve history and the ideas that gave birth to the statue. They should be preserved at all costs, lest we forget and repeat some of the bad ideas that the statues embody. They should not, however, be a symbol of our government, by the people, for the people, as Indians would say. They shouldn't be, they shouldn't be a symbol of that. Um, um, I think that they have an important historical place. But if the controversy is about the kind of confederacy statues that are on display in the South in many places, these are statues of, politically speaking, um, traitors. You're lionizing a traitor to the Union. You're lionizing racism. And when you put that in front of a school or a courthouse, you're saying there's, no, there's not going to be any justice here. There's going to be injustice because there's a bias that the courthouse has embraced. And it has put that bias on display by a surrogate using a statue of Stonewall Jackson, of Robert E. Lee. Columbus, a dubious figure, but an important one. He's important because he introduced Europeans on a formal level to so-called New World. But he was an enslaver. He was a, a person who committed genocide against Native Americans. He was a liar. Uh, he was a scammer. Uh, but he was an important figure. So if there's a statue of Columbus. It shouldn't be a Columbus circle. It should be, it, it should be somewhere in a museum where we could say, well, this is what was Columbus, what he looked like. This is the history of him. This is Stonewall Jackson. So there may, there may be all these controversial statues that stand for bad principles um, of human living uh, should be in one, na one, one um, national park, a national park of statues maybe, and other, other things that people could visit. And there would be some commentary about these people's contributions and their roles, good or bad, in our history. Because history should record the good and the bad but it should never lionize the bad. Hmm. So maybe we should put all of them together and be like, hey, maybe let's not try to do that again? Yeah, mm -hmm. because some, e either a person's life is a lesson or a blessing. A blessing. It's a lesson we should learn from, don't do that, or it's a blessing we should follow that. But, we, but uh, it, these statues are often statues of traitors. Uh, if someone uh, did something, the things that they did now, they'd be shot or hung or whatever we do to people nowadays, you know, lethal injection or something. Because mm -hmm. they're traitors. But not just traitors to the American political system, traitors to the idea that's in the Declaration of Independence and in the amendments to the Constitution. I'll say in the amendments rather than the Constitution because the amendments corrected some things that were missing in the Constitution. Mm. The second, second story I want to talk about is the one you said is your favorite, Ruby and the Pearl. Before you tell us a little about the story, why is it your favorite? I was challenged when I wrote that story. I was listening to a record of Yumak Sumak, a famous singer who had four octave range from Peru. And um, when I was writing the story, I was trying to capture the songs that she was singing, two of them, 
into the rhythm of the poetry. So that if one read the poetry a certain way, you could hear the song that she was singing. I was trying to use the English language. I was trying to bridge, make a bridge between poetry and music. And so uh, that's my, it's my favorite story for that reason, because I overcame a challenge. And secondly, um, it talks about destiny, the destiny of the human situation. The human, the human being is good, and he's destined for good. No matter what, how many wars we go through, at the end of the day, we conquer our demons. And this story, it shows that love, love conquers the obstacles between the ruby and, and the pearl coming back together and being together forever after having been separated for thousands of years. And uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a story of hope. And it was a challenge for me. And that's one of the reasons why I like it. Mm. You said uh, human people are destined for goods to defeat our demons. Mm -hmm. But throughout history, there's some people who have just never have defeated their demons. What do you think of a person who could just never get over it or defeat it? It becomes a very valuable lesson to others who watch his life and say, oh, you see what happened to so-and-so? Why did that happen to him? Because he did this, this, and this. Or he stood for he stood he stood for this. Hitler. Uh, a great lesson about um, the belief that you're superior that you're superior to someone because of the way you look or your bloodstream. And that you had to sustain your existence by killing and destroying people you perceive as possibly ruining your bloodstream. KKK, Hitler, Hitler called it positive Christianity, you know. But if that's positive Christianity, then there's no Christianity. And that was his philosophy, he was called. He said, Jesus went into the temple and the kill, uh, the turned over the table of the money changers who were Jews. Therefore, we had to get rid of the Jews out of, out of, of Germany, that they're the money changers. So that was his justification for the final solution. But he became a lesson because it was the wrong thinking. And people don't understand what was at risk, what was, what was at stake if he had succeeded. Yeah. There's definitely a lot of social commentaries about that today, yeah. depicting that. And it definitely would have been bad if he had one. But now mm -hmm. we've defeated him, so we can see. Now we know what to save off from. And we've always defeated those ideas, even though they may have lasted 100 years or 400 years. In the end, those ideas are, are defeated. Mm -hmm. The good will over try, try over, over evil. Throughout the book, you make numerous references to rubies. The ruby throated hummingbird, ruby tipped swords. Does this gene have some sort of significance to you? The ruby is a, is a symbol um, of the human mind. Um, and it's passion for knowledge. It's passion for learning. The pearl is a symbol of the human heart. And it's empathy and compassion. Like I said earlier, that there's a hu inside the human being, there are two forces. One is the husband, it's the brain or the head, and it, and the one is the heart. It's in, the heart is inside, it's hidden, it can't see, it's blind. The head looks out for the heart. That's why the head is above the heart, is to protect the heart. But the heart has compassion, it has moral compass, and so. This story about the ruby and pearl is not just about a ruby and a pearl. It's about the joining and unity between the head and the heart, between the spiritual world and, and the world of the emotional love and, uh, and the material world that is attached to that. The mother instinct, the father instinct. Um, we, we, we see the world, in the complete, complete human vision is when these two parts come together. When the mind and the heart are united, there's peace within the human being. Mm. So we all should unite our head and heart. 
we should. And we should, we should keep the good, uh, you know, <laughs> I'll, put, I'll put it this way. Sometimes the heart goes out on emotions. And the head says, oh, hold on a second, this, this, calm down, calm down. Let's look at the facts here. Because you can't see what I see, because I'm up, I'm up above you, so I'm going to tell you what I see. I think we shouldn't go that way. But the heart says, that's wrong, we got to do something about it now. Well, the head says, let's get a plan. Sometimes the brain brings something home to the human being, and the heart says, honey, I don't think that idea is right. I, well, the brain says, why? It's intelligent. Something's wrong about that idea you just bring it into us. It doesn't feel right, it's, it's immoral. I can't tell you exactly what it is. So sometimes the husband listens to the wife and says, well, okay, we won't invite that guy to dinner. An idea like that could be like racism. Or yes, like yes. The heart yeah. says, you might have grown up as a kid in the Kuka clan family. When you're a kid, your heart is pure. But dad, why do we have to hate black people? That's the heart speaking. Because mm -hmm. the they're niggers. The brain says, cause the heart says, there's something wrong with it. I, I can't accept it. So, you know, we, my book tries to address that we need to unite the good thought process and the good emotional process and have a balance in our lives and in our society. Definitely. The last story I chose was another tale told by an idiot. The king and the donkey and the pachyderm. Tell us a little bit about this story. Well, this story is about, in one, one sense, the formation of the Republican Party and the um, Democratic Party. But the king likes to go hunting, and he's trying to find someone that can tell the weather. And basically, he kills all the, the, the weathermen because they get it wrong, because when it rains, he can't go hunting. So finally, a farmer comes in and tells the king, I can tell the weather. And so he gets it right every time. So he gets invited to be the royal weatherman. But the farmer brings his two donkeys into the palace, and the king says, what's this? He, he said, these are my donkeys. They tell the weather. When the tail goes up, it's going to rain. So the king says, well, I can't. Wait a minute. I, I can't have donkeys in the palace. I'm going to send the donkeys to parliament. So that's how donkeys got to parliament. And basically, the, 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 the he goes to war, king goes to war and he needs gold. So he needs a gold a gold finding machine or something. So the farmer shows up again with the um, elephants, and the elephants um, are able to sniff out the gold he needs to pay his soldiers from the earth. So the goal becomes the, the elephants become the uh, the organization called the GOP, Gold Opportunity People, or diggers, or whatever. So it's talking about two philosophies in government. Trickle-down economics, the gold represents, and the elephants represent the idea that if you don't tax the rich people, you cut their taxes, it's going to trickle down into the society. And the donkey represents the common people who are moved by the weather, the trends in society, uh, the uh, fashions. And so the king, king has his power by having controlling fashions and having the idea of belief or the rich people need to be sustained. So it's a political children's story, but it's a story about a king, the donkey, and the elephants on, a, on, a, on the surface. But it has several stories tied to that. So I make a joke about, you know, that because Andrew, Andrew Jackson was the first one, to, he's a Democrat, by the way, to use a donkey to represent the common people. Jesus, Jesus comes into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. The donkey represents his support, the common people's support of his teachings. Then you go back in the early in the scriptures, you have Balaam on the back of a donkey in the Old Testament. And the donkey's talking to him, like, why am I being oppressed? So the donkey represents the common people who have been oppressed and carrying the burdens of society. And the elephant represents the fat cat, the fat elephant, so to speak, represents the gold trickling down, the golden the idea uh, uh, that came out of Adam Smith, Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations. Don't touch the rich man. He hires the butler, the maid, the, the chamberman, the, the, the bodyguard. So that whole philosophy in American history is called trickle-down economics. And the other philosophy is called demand economics, you know. 
has to do with you give money to poor people, they're going to spend it and give it back to the rich people. You stimulate the economy. Mm. And the king, at the end of the day, kind of represents America as a whole? A it, represents the, it represents the capitalist system of, Amer of America in the West and represents mercantilism, which led to slavery. It, re it, re it represents the, all the ancestors of capitalism, the way it's been constructed, going back to the 15th century. You conclude this tale with never under underestimate a donkey. They are not as stupid as people say. Elephants are elegant and cunning, no matter how much they weigh. Mm -hmm. They too have political agility and can dance yeah, a fancy ballet. Can you explain what this means? Yeah. Uh, common people are not stupid. They've just been misinformed, miseducated. And so that's why I said the donkeys are not stupid. The word donkey is a synonym for stupidity. And the donkey's been used by the Democratic Party and it's a symbol of the manipula how manipulable people are, the common person, as they say, as they see it. And the elephant appears to be this clumsy rich guy, but the rich man has a heart, a human heart too. So he can dance a fancy ballet. It means he can learn to be balanced in his wealth and be a philanthropist, a person who uh, is sensitive to other people. He doesn't have to be the big elephant in the room all the time and that, that sucks in out all the air. He can be a, a real country. He can dance the fancy ballet of balance, being a balanced individual. That's what that means. And to take it maybe a little way from the land of not into earth right here, mm -hmm. um, with our president right now, what do you think he has on not only politics, but the effect he has on had on humanity as a whole? He's a wildfire, uh, destroying the citadel of, mora of human ra morality and human uprightness. He's a wildfire, like the fire in California is out of control. Um, but he's not the one that set the fire. He is a symbol of the people who want to break down the society uh, into its competing parts so they can steal uh, the soul of America and steal the wealth of America. A lot of these depressions and everything uh, are artificially stimulated. stimulated. Uh, and the, the benefit of those, these phenomena of rich people who come in after a war and buy up everything for 10 cents on a dollar, one cent on the dollar, and as Madison said in the Federalist Papers, number 10, he said, the American society can be kept whole by having competing factions. Federalist Paper number 10. By having this faction against that faction, there's no one faction that will ever be powerful enough to overthrow the government. And, and one, of the, one, of the, one of the philosophies of the Founding Fathers was to keep control of the government among a certain people. The Constitution says, we, the people of the United States, in order to preserve liberty and secure the blessing to ourselves and our families, do constitute this Constitution. And there are 39 signatures. And those 39 people believe that their class were the only ones capable of ruling this country and preserving it and, and advancing it. So they didn't allow people to elect a the president. They allowed the people elect uh, an elector to elect the whole college, which would elect the president. And those electors would be people who were from their class. So what uh, Trump has done is taken um, the natural fractions and fissures in the society and he's exploited it and have it fighting each other. But meantime, it, it, it's, a, it's a distraction. It's a ninja smoke bomb. So people who are in control can take control of more things. This is why the Black Lives Matter movement and, and the Nazi skinhead movement, yes, both sides believe in those ideas, but Trump is playing them off against each other and stimulating the nationalist side, the white nationalist side of this and embracing them so you can keep this fight going. And it was, it, this tempest in the teapot was always part of the strategy of people who control the country trying to keep control of it. When the tempest gets out of the pot, what happens is a civil war. But until that time, it's a tempest in the teapot that the cook keeps stoking.
which is the president and certain other powers that be. So you think maybe in a couple years we might face another civil war? Not, not, not a uh, physical civil war, cultural civil war. Mm. You know, uh, we, we're facing that now. We're, we're in the middle of a cultural civil war. A culture that's retroactive, going back to the 50s, and even Roy Moore talked about slavery, slavery being the best times for America. And a more progressive humani humanitarian vision where people see each other as being humans and the, the oppressed peoples, uh, Africans, Asians, Latinos, and, and whites uh, who don't have any racist bones, they see people as being humans, have come together and said, we have another vision of how human si society can be. It can be a society where our diversity are the legs of our unity. So you have those two ideas competing against each other. And there's some people who are puppeteers who are just trying to keep that going so they could grab more power from the center. So uh, I sort of see American history as a conflict, in, conflict between ideas like that. Um, and the masses actually um, participating in this play. Um, as Shakespeare would say, it's a play. But we're not the authors of the play. We come into this world and we're given a script. Oh, this is who you are? This is your script. Oh, you're, you're one of those, huh? Well, this is your script. And it's a, and it's a, it's a play. And you think in this uh, play that we call life, you think maybe we ever get to go backstage or maybe write our own script or maybe we're just stuck because who we are? I think the script, the script of how to live a decent human life as a human being has been written by God and he's given to people in different religions. It's all the same. Basically, you love your neighbors, you love yourself. Respect the good instincts, moral instincts that we all share. Um, everybody knows that murder is wrong. I mean. Everybody knows that helping a person who fell down, help them stand up is right. So these, these things that make us human. So if we cling to those things, these, those ideas that make us human, that make us good humans, we win, we always win. Because the civilization that fails to live up these things, what happens, they collapse. And then winter comes, but spring, spring always comes after winter. And the things that we thought were dead are really alive. And they always come back. And they always come back. That's why I said we're going to win. Hmm. Now, one can't but take note of your writing style. For instance, you write, the judge was so mad that he started to throw the book at Snaz, but the book was too heavy and the judge was too weak. One thing I noticed, though, was that the word God, you put a dash instead of the letter O. Why is that? Yes, um, because the word God has been used to uh, denigrate God. If you spell God backwards, what is, it, what is the word? It's dog. By putting the hyphen in the, by putting the, hyphen in the middle, you re remove the O. And um, our Jewish brothers and sisters and many others, we, you know, when they spell the word God in English, they take the word O out so that God could not be blasphemed or misused because the word, the word God is, is, and dog are, are the same thing in terms of just change the order of the letters. So we prevent that and show that God has, should have that respect. Because after all, we're dealing with the English language and it, is, it can be manipulated in that word. Like I took the name Lufman and made it Fulman. I could do that. So I'm looking at the word God and say, wait a minute. You spell it backwards, it's a dog. You know, you spell live backwards, it's evil, right? So those of us who think that way would try to avoid the reader we show, we, show, we show respect to God by spelling it that way. I hope that makes sense to you. Yeah, and in a way to protect its yeah, sacredness. Yeah, it's, it's sanctity. Yes. Another thing that grabbed my attention was the parable times two. You write, souls go to various destinations. The first stop is one of the two schools, higher education or higher education. The soul must choose. One will make him a slave and the other a free man in the city. This almost sounds like you are against higher education. No, I'm not against higher education. Uh, I'm against higher education, H-I-R-E. If education is to enslave you, and the, all you can get out of it is a good job, working on someone else's dream, then it's miseducation. I'm not, I'm not against jobs. 
But in our school systems, they don't train us to think. They train us to memorize and get back what they tell us. You know, two plus two is four. You memorize that. We don't even ask why. Why is two, two? Where did they come from? We don't ask why anymore. And when we, and we finish the process of education, you get a degree, and you go out and you look for a job, and you're working on someone else's dream. And they give you a salary. And so what you've gotten is a higher education, an education that allows you to be hired by someone. If you've got a higher education, now it allows you to be an entrepreneur. You think about creating something and perhaps other people working for you on your dream. And their whole communities have been disenfranchised in the African-American community from the idea of a higher education that stands above the idea of working on someone else's plantation. In fact, they used to call it a, a, a factory used to be called the plant. That was short for plantation. So um, higher education uh, frees your mind to think beyond the borders of what's in the textbook, beyond the borders of what the teacher is saying, and to ask questions. That, and if you, if you can't ask those questions, you'll never get the answers beyond what is, what is being said in the classroom. And the classroom is really often a place that confines our thinking instead of, instead of expanding it. And we should encourage the expansion of our thinking. Without the expansion of our thinking, we would never have any Einsteins. You, you would never have any Benjamin Bannockers people that push boundaries and inventors do this all the time. Inventors sometimes have a higher education than the people who are teaching in the colleges because they're able to think outside the box that we were put in. And it's often the boxes, the, the educational boxes often the coffin in which our imagination is buried. 